The story you are about to hear is a compilation of documented true facts featuring historical characters, events, or places that has played a role in shaping history. Please sit back and listen as I recite this narrative for you. Each country has their own version and names for the vampires. But one of the most common features that a vampire, a folklore character that has been fascinating for most macabre aficionado, is that they exist by feeding on someone's blood. Richard Chase was one disturbed serial killer. He was dubbed the Vampire of Sacramento. He lived his life under a series of powerful delusions that had fatal consequences. Chase made the papers when he killed and mutilated the bodies of six victims in Sacramento, California in the late 1970s. Given his nickname, it doesn't come as much of a surprise that Richard Chase's trademark was drinking the blood of his victims after he killed them. But believe it or not, drinking his victims' blood wasn't even the vampire killer's most disturbing trait. Richard Chase showed signs of mental illness at a young age, but his father, a strict and sometimes physically abusive parent, did little to get him help. Chase was disturbed and unhappy as a child, and his symptoms grew worse in adolescence. He set several small fires, frequently wet the bed, and displayed signs of cruelty toward animals. These three habits are sometimes called the McDonald Triad or the Triad of Sociopathy, proposed by psychiatrist J. M. McDonald in 1963 as a predictor of sociopathy in a patient. Chase's problems grew worse when his father allegedly kicked him out of the house. Without supervision, Chase turned to alcohol and drugs, which quickly turned into substance abuse. Psychotropic drugs exacerbated the symptoms of his illness. By the time he was 18, Chase was using drugs almost every day, specifically marijuana and LSD. He also drank heavily. Despite this, he did okay in high school and graduated. The substance abuse made him increasingly paranoid and delusional, particularly in regards to his health. He regularly complained of bizarre health problems, including that his pulmonary artery had been stolen and that his blood was turning into powder. He became convinced that his heart would stop beating at times as a result of these ailments. Like the vampire whose moniker he would soon adopt, he became convinced on several occasions that his heart had stopped. At times, he thought he was a walking corpse. But being occasionally dead was no reason to neglect his health. Fearing that he lacked vitamin C, he reportedly pressed whole oranges to the skin of his forehead, believing that his brain would absorb the nutrients directly. One of his strangest and most powerful delusions involved his skull. He felt that his cranial bones had split apart and began to shift beneath his skin, changing places and jumbling like puzzle pieces. He shaved his head in an effort to monitor their movements. After graduating, he moved out of his parents' home. He was eager to leave, having become convinced that his mother was trying to poison him. Chase moved into an apartment with several roommates, but things went south almost immediately. It seems that they didn't know Chase well, and when he persisted in unusual behavior, he would walk around naked all the time and his drug use was worse than ever, his roommates demanded that he move out. Chase refused, so they moved out instead. Now that he had the apartment to himself, he began bringing the animals he caught, such as birds and rabbits, into the apartment. Then he would eat them raw or he would put them in a blender with Coca-Cola and drink the concoction. 
Chase could not afford to stay in the apartment alone for long, so he ended up moving back home. His father found another apartment for his son to rent. Chase was once again living on his own, a circumstance that almost always exacerbated the symptoms of his condition. Unsurprisingly, at the age of 25, Chase was diagnosed with paranoid schizophrenia and was institutionalized in 1975 to prevent him from becoming a danger to himself. His fascination with blood earned him the nickname Dracula among the psychiatric hospital's assistants who witnessed him kill and attempt to drink the blood of several birds in an effort to stave off the effects of poison that was, he imagined, slowly turning his own blood to powder. In a way, the blood became his self-prescribed heart medication, as doctors would not take him seriously. Possibly more disturbingly, the killing of animals also remedied his impotence. While Chase did have girlfriends in high school, their relationships never lasted long due to his sexual problems. It was his attempt to inject himself with rabbit's blood. Doing uh, things with small animals, animals and birds, you know, killing them, drinking their blood. He needed extensive care. He was not receiving as much care as he should have gotten which made him violently ill that had resulted in his institutionalization. In spite of several similar incidents, the staff believed that they had rehabilitated Chase and he was released to live with his mother. It was a fatal decision as Chase's condition wasn't improving. He was growing worse. Though Richard Chase had been released into his mother's care, there was nothing legally binding that forced him to stay with her. Not long after his release from the psychiatric hospital, he moved out, later saying he thought his mother was poisoning him again. In August of 1977, calls from residents of the reservation were made to the Washoe County Sheriff's Department about a man at the lake wandering around aimlessly, his clothes covered in bloodstains. The police arrived and searched Chase's truck, in which they found guns and a large bucket full of blood. They discovered that it was in fact only cow's blood. Explaining that the blood on his clothes was from hunting, Chase was released without incident, only having to pay a fine. This event should have served as a warning sign that small animals were no longer satisfying Chase's needs. As it was, alone with no one to watch him or rein him in, he fell more deeply under the power of his delusions, until finally, they prompted him to do the unthinkable. On December 29, 1977, Richard Chase was frustrated and lonely. His mother hadn't allowed him to come home for Christmas. He would later recall and he was mad. He killed a person, as opposed to an animal, for the first time. Ambrose Griffin, 51, was shot and killed in front of his home as he was helping his wife unload groceries from their car. Due to the drive-by nature of the murder, Chase was not identified as the murderer until weeks later. The killing of Ambrose Griffin was by far the least violent of Chase's murders, which took place the following month. Chase waited nearly four weeks before he killed again. There was no order to how he selected his victims other than he would try doors of random houses. And if they were locked, he saw it as a sign that he was not welcome. He did not forcefully break into any homes. The second murder, which took place sometime in the early afternoon of January 23, 1978, was of 22-year-old Terry Wallen, who was three months pregnant at the time. Terry's murder was beyond abhorrent. She was shot three times and her abdomen slashed to reveal her internal organs. Chase then had sex with her corpse. Before he left, he found an empty yogurt cup, collected some of her blood, and drank it. Terry's fiancé, David, arrived home from work to find her mutilated body on their bed. In a state of shock, he ran next door to a neighbor's house where they called the police. 
The first officer to arrive at the scene was so horrified by what had been done to Terry, he confessed that he had nightmares for months following the murder. FBI agent Robert Ressler, who is best known for his work in criminal profiling and is credited with coining the term serial killer, was contacted right away to consult on what kind of killer was responsible for the horrific crime. Ressler came up with a profile of the killer. Agent Ressler classified the killer as a disorganized offender, meaning no planning was involved in the murder, likely seriously mentally ill and cannot distinguish between right and wrong. Police searched tirelessly for the murderer over the next three days but came up with nothing. People kept telling us that they saw this strange looking individual, he was a white male, maybe six foot tall, wearing a bright orange parka, very scraggly hair, very thin, very emaciated looking, who had actually peered into people's houses. Then, on January 27, the call came in that they had been dreading. A North Sacramento resident was going to visit their neighbor, but when no one answered the door, they entered the home and found three dead bodies. Each had been shot and badly brutalized. They were Evelyn Miroth, 36 years old, who had suffered a similar fate to Terry Wallen, Evelyn's six-year-old son Jason, and a family friend Danielle Meredith, 56. Evelyn's nephew, 22-month-old Michael Ferreira, was missing and was assumed to have been abducted by the killer. It was a young woman in her late 20s who gave them the lead they had been looking for. She explained that on January 23, around 11.30 a.m. or 12 p.m., she had seen a man she went to high school with at a shopping mall. It turned out the mall was less than a mile from Terry Wallin's home. She had been shocked by his appearance. He was extremely thin and pale, with huge dark circles around his eyes. His clothing hung loosely off his emaciated frame. He wore a sweatshirt with what looked like large blood stains. As she was getting in her car to drive away, he pursued her, saying he wanted to talk. He approached the car and tried to yank open the door, but she quickly drove away. She explained that the man's name was Richard Chase. They had graduated from high school in 1968. Chase's apartment was less than a block away from where they had found the station wagon. It wasn't long before Chase appeared, leaving the apartment with a box under his arm. When he realized what was going on, he ran towards his truck. His panic state made it pretty clear to authorities that they had found who they were looking for. Officers tackled Chase, getting him on the ground. He had a 22 revolver in a shoulder holster and Daniel Meredith's wallet in his back pocket. In the box was a bundle of bloody rags he had been planning to get rid of. Inside Chase's apartment was a plethora of evidence. They found his bloody food blenders, newspaper articles about the murder of Ambrose Griffin, bloody clothing and knives stolen from Terry Wallen's house. His truck was a garbage dump on wheels filled with beer cans and blood rags. A calendar in his home had the dates of the murders marked with the word today. Chase was arrested. The sensational trial of the Vampire of Sacramento began on January 2, 1979 and lasted five months. He was charged with six counts of first-degree murder. Shell casings from Chase's gun found at the Ambrose Griffin crime scene proved that he was guilty of the murder. On March 24, the body of Michael Ferreira was found discarded in a box by some garbage bins in a church parking lot. It was the church janitor who discovered the body and called the police. It was difficult to identify the body at first because of what had been done to it. The defense attorneys rejected the suggested death penalty on the grounds that Chase was not guilty by reason of insanity. In the end, after five hours of deliberation, the jury took the side of the prosecution. Richard Chase, the vampire killer, was found guilty on all accounts. He was sentenced to death by electric chair and would await his execution at San Quentin State Prison. While at San Quentin, Chase was largely avoided by other inmates. 
they had heard about the sheer brutality of his crimes and wanted nothing to do with him. He admitted to the murders to the agents, but said he had no choice in the matter. He had to commit them in order to stay alive. Nazis and UFOs, which Chase was deathly afraid of, also came up multiple times in the interview. At one point, he stuck his hands in his pockets, pulling out a handful of macaroni and cheese. Convinced that the prison guards were Nazis trying to kill him, he asked that wrestler take the food and test it for poison. On December 26, 1980, Richard Chase was found dead in his cell due to an overdose of antidepressants he had been hoarding. He was 30 years old. Hey everyone, I just wanted to express how grateful I am that you took the time to listen to my narration. Hopefully you enjoyed it. I am Twisted Mind and please enjoy the rest of your day. Salamat.